Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. Our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We bring you weekly topics and thought-provoking guests to get you to stop, reflect and think about what it means to be a leader in a modern world. Our aim is to help you become the leader you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Today's episode is brought to you by my new book, You're a Leader, Now What? The Proven Path to High Performance Leadership. The book contains many of the great lessons that we've been learning together during the Leadership Project podcast, together with many other lessons that I've collected over my 30-year career as a leader. The book is aimed at first-time leaders, but really there's lessons in there for everyone. It would be greatly appreciated if you could go and grab your copy on Amazon as either an ebook or a paperback, and if you could leave us an honest review on Amazon. Now, on with the show. Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm joined today by Corey Chadwick, and I've been looking forward to this conversation since I met Corey last year. Corey describes himself as a proud dad and husband, and I love that he starts with that. And then he's a mental fitness and mindset coach and an optimist. And he's the founder of an organization called The Mental Gym. And today we're going to be talking about mental fitness. What does that mean? How is it different? to mental health? How is it different to therapy and his concepts around proactive wellness? I won't go any deeper now because I want to hear from Corey about those uh, concepts. So Corey, please do introduce yourself to our audience. Tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to be with us today. Sure. Mick, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, So I got started, I, I think, as probably a teenager, just I, I like breaking things down. I like knowing how things work. I like thinking analytically and thinking differently. Uh, my father was a lawyer. We used to sit down at the dinner table and he used to give me these situations, legal situations or world issues. And he'd ask me for my opinion. And I'd think about it and I'd kind of make my case. Here's why I think it should be this way. Or here's why I think it's, this is the right answer. And he'd always kind of give me the same answer. He'd say like, hey, no, g- good thought, well thought out. You'd make a good case. But what about this? And he would just play devil's advocate with me. It would always stretch me to think differently and push me to think in different directions. And that was really the start of my, my kind of need and, and desire to think differently and learn how to think kind of in, in different ways than we usually do. Um, my mother suffered from mental illness uh, around the same time in my life. And this was at a time where people didn't really talk about mental health. It was very kind of taboo. There was a big stigma about it. So it wasn't a popular conversation. Um, so much so that my mother tried to hide it from just about everybody, including myself and my brother. So we had no idea how bad things were. Um, but it, it took over her life and eventually led to her taking her life. And it was terrible. Um, it was, it was, it was a scary and and heartbreaking time. You know, you're not supposed to lose your mom like that. Um, and I was scared that this might be coming for me too, that my life might go down a similar road. And I realized I had two choices. I could either kind of just cross my fingers and hope that everything worked out for me and that I didn't go down a similar path, uh, or I could choose to be proactive and do something about it. Uh, Choice number one wasn't really my style. It wasn't really speaking to me. And so I decided to be proactive and I started working on my own mental fitness. At the time, I didn't know what it was. Um, I just knew that it made sense to try to take control of my mind to little bit at a time, one little adjustment at a time, rewire and, and almost upgrade how I would think and how I would make decisions and how I would behave. And over time, all of those adjustments started adding up and adding up and adding up, really compounding to, to something that, that was quite remarkable, where people would say things to me like, what have you figured out that we haven't figured out? Because things were clicking for me. Business was taking off. I was happier than it had ever been. Relationships were thriving all because of this kind of system of thinking and decision-making that I had been developing um, for years. 
I was a, a psych major in university. So this all made sense to me. In fact, my mother was a therapist and my father being the lawyer, I feel like was that kind of perfect combination of the, the analytical, logical thinker and the, the, the person who genuinely cared about people and that empathetic nature and, and putting that together that really helped me kind of learn to think differently and approach life in a bit of a different way. Um, it was when I lost my mom that the, the idea of living near 10 first showed up for me. I started thinking about life on a spectrum, like a scale from one to 10 and recognizing that where we are on that scale, uh, really determines who we are and how we show up and the kind of lives that we live. When you're lower on that scale, I was certainly lower on that scale at the time of, of losing my mom. It's the lowest I had ever been. She was certainly lower on that scale even than me. And, uh, and when you're kind of out of your norm, if you will, you see perspective, you have a different perspective than you normally would. And I saw this, this scale from one to 10. And I was at one end of the scale and I had this, this thought that it just made sense to me that if there's one end of the scale, there must be another end to the scale. If there's a worst, there has to be a best. So if this is the worst it can get, what's the best it can get? All of a sudden, it didn't make sense to me to say, I want to live a six or a seven. I wanted to live my 10. And so I just planted my flag in the ground and I made a declaration to myself that I'm going to live my 10 and this is what my life's going to be about. Um, at the time, I, I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot of information and there was a whole lot I needed to learn, but I was committed to, to the journey and the process. Um, so when I was combining that with that kind of system of, of thinking and decision-making and making these adjustments over time, all these puzzle pieces started coming together. It's like the dots were connecting and things were making more sense and, and just kind of flowing. Um, I was in a career where I was good at what I did and I was successful. I was in the restaurant and bar business. And I had a lot of really good things going for me. And I wasn't one of those people who hated my work. I really enjoyed it and I was good at it. And I was in a position where I was looking at growing my company. And I, I just felt like, like I wanted more than this. And it wasn't more financially and it wasn't more in a business sense. It's just something was missing in my life. And this is the first time I really remember feeling that way, that, that there was a real lack of purpose for me in what I was doing which I always knew was important for me, but it's kind of, this is when it really hit me that, that this was missing from my life. Um, I felt like I was kind of hitting a ceiling on how much potential I was realizing. That was always a theme in my life that I felt like I had potential, but I didn't know what to do with it or how to direct it or what questions to ask. And it's kind of like this feeling that there's a version of yourself that deep down you believe you could be, but you just don't know how to get there. Like you don't know how to get from here to there and become that version of yourself. And I recognized that time in my life because life was good, because I was good at my work and because I was making good money and I had good friends and I had a wonderful girlfriend who at the time I thought I would marry, I was checking a lot of the boxes in life. And I realized how easy it would be to just kind of say, yeah, this is good enough. This is my life. It's fine. And who am I to complain? But I remember this promise that I made to myself that I'm not going to live a six or a seven. I'm going to live my 10. And, um, that was the first time in my life where I realized I had to, to make a real commitment to, to be in who I wanted to be and live in the life I wanted to live. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit in this journey to becoming a dad. And when I became a dad for any parents out there, you know, that everything changes once, once you become a parent, once your kids are born. And I felt this real sense of responsibility to try to make the world a better place for my sons to grow up in. And I realized that I had something here that I had been working on and developing for my own use, but I saw that there was a chance to share this with others. And so I got to work developing the methodology and the curriculum for living your 10. And I started sharing it with people and the more people that I shared it with. And eventually this became my business. Um, the more I was driven to find the best way to share it. And I was seeing this ripple effect happen by people who were just drawn to the idea of living their own 10 the more driven I was to find the best way to share it, I was just, it was racking my brain. Like, how, how do I do this? And there's all these, these different ways of doing it. And I was in the middle of a CrossFit class one day, working out in this group exercise class model, which I love so much. And then the light bulb goes off for me that we have these gyms for our bodies. We need a gym for our minds. And that's what, that's what the, uh, got the mental gym started and the idea started. And, um, well, that's what brings us here today, I guess. Wonderful, uh, Corey. Thank you so much for sharing so openly with us. 
there's a lot to unpack there and we will unpack it during the, the course of the interview. The, the birth of the mental gym, now I get where that came from, very good and we're definitely going to come back to that. The continuum of you know, everything in life is on a continuum from minus 10 to plus 10 if you like and where do you want to be on that scale? Do you want to be a six or a seven or do you want to be living your fullest life? And this experience that you had where you felt like you were checking boxes and to the outside world, people probably thought you had it all sorted, like you were living a good life and had a good job, well paid, all of these things. And you were doing what I'm going to say society expects of you uh, in that regard, but you were still feeling not completely fulfilled. Um, and you spoke about purpose. We'll definitely come back to that. I will really want to acknowledge you for, for that self-awareness of understanding where your parents came in uh, with that, uh, both the, the lessons that your father taught you and then also um, your mother. And I want to say straight off that, you know, I'm sorry to hear of your loss with your mother. It's, it's, that's not something that, um, that anyone wants to go through. So very sorry to hear of your loss. You spoke about the stigma associated with mental health and you said at the time it was a very taboo topic. You've piqued my curiosity. Do you really feel that we've broken the stigma of mental health? No, I definitely don't. We, we, the conversation has certainly made progress. Um, in the last couple of years, people are talking more about mental health than ever before, which is great. Uh, but no, we're, we're not there. We've got a long way to go. Um, we should be speaking about mental health the same way we talk about physical health. There's no stigma there. It's you, you want to work out, you want to eat better. You want to take care of yourself. That's just a part of life. It's a, it's a good life decision. Um, we should be talking about mental health the same way and we haven't normalized it yet. The world will be a better place once it's a normalized conversation. Mm. It has improved. Um, the conversation has started, but we can do so much better. And it depends on which stats you read. This is for the audience at home. Just picture this. Depending on which statistics you read, it's either one in four or one in five people in the world suffer from some form of men mental illness, right? So just have a look at wherever you are right now. If you're listening to this podcast in your car, if you're out walking, if you're sitting with your family, just look left, look right, look around you. And then imagine that one in five or one in four of those people is suffering in some way with some form of mental illness. Just picture that right now. And you'll see just how prevalent it is and that we need to do so much better. One in four or one in five. It could be yourself. You could be listening to this program and you could be having an awareness moment right now of, yeah, I do struggle with things, whether it be depression or other forms of mental health issues. And they are health issues. There's nothing to be, have a stigma about or to be concerned about. We need in a society where people can raise their hand and say, you know what, things aren't quite right and I do need some help. And I do think that the stigma, we're improving, but that stigma still exists. Any reflections there, Corey? No, I, I'm with you on that. Um, I know we'll get into it. The, the, the work that, that we do and the focus that we do is, um, I know we talked about a scale from one to 10. If you think of mental health on a scale from one to 10, um, there are people all over that scale and that spectrum. And the conversation that, that you're speaking about right now, and the one that certainly needs to be more of a normalized conversation is for people who are perhaps on the lower side of that scale. And that, you know, out of 10, one, two, three, four kind of range. Um, and I, and I think it's great that we're starting to, to pay more attention to that, to, to, like you said, one in four, one in five people, but it's, it's not one in a thousand. It's, it's a very, normal thing. Um, and where, where we come in in our work is mental well-being and mental health is an everybody conversation. It's not just a some people. It's not a one out of five. It's an everybody conversation. It affects everybody. Again, think of your mental health same way you think of your physical health. Physical health affects everybody. So does mental health. 
and where there are more and more resources becoming available for people who are, say, on one side of that scale, if you will, uh, the people in the middle are, no one's talking to them. People who are five, six, seven, no one's talking to them. People who are even an eight, no one's talking to them because the idea is, well, you're fine. So we don't need to, we don't need to talk to you about this. And they're being ignored. Again, mental well-being is for everybody. So those people who are right in the middle of, of that, that's the conversation that, that we're most excited about. Um, they need a solution for them. They want to think and feel and perform at their best. They, they're fine, but they want to be better. And we're giving them a place to do that. Okay, so what I'm hearing there, so when we speak about mental health, we do talk about someone that might be sitting at a, a one, a two, or a three on that scale. And what you're saying is, and that's the one in four, one in five people in the world, but what you're saying is there's a place in this for all of us. We could be sitting at a six or a seven. We might even be at an eight or a nine, but what does it take to get to a 10? That's really interesting, uh, Corey. So let's talk about that now. You talk about there being a difference between mental fitness and mental health and that it's not therapy. So what is mental fitness? So. If you think about mental health and physical health, just as like, again, everybody has a level of health that you're at, a level of healthiness that you're at. And then fitness would be the thing that you do. So you would go work out your body at a gym. You're going to work on your fitness. You're going to a fitness, physical fitness gym, if you will. Mental fitness is the same thing. So for us, it's about working out your mind. It's about being proactive with your wellness, it's not reactive, proactive. Again, I'm fine. I'm good. I don't want to be great. So we think of it as proactive wellness for people who want to grow and move from good to great. And it really is all about thinking and making decisions and feeling and performing as the very best version of yourself in all areas of your life. Scale from one to 10, we're not here to live a six or a seven. We're here to live our 10. That's, that's what our version of mental fitness looks like. And it might look different for different people. Again, mental fitness, think of it like physical fitness. There's different types of gyms. There's different ways of working out. Ours is all about living your 10 and, uh, and we love it. Mm, okay. So I want to now play that back and I'm going to keep on using the, the gym metaphor because it makes sense mm. and it's, it's what your business is based around. It seems to me, Corey, that something that you never finished with. Yeah. If you go to a physical gym you are, and you're working out, cardio, anaerobic, whatever is your flavor. When you're in a routine and you've got a habit of going to the gym, you are either always improving your fitness or you're maintaining your fitness. When you stop going to the gym, you start going backwards. And I think everyone in the audience knows that. Is, right. Yeah. Is that the, everyone can relate to that one. Yeah. So yeah. is this the same thing with, with, um, with mental fitness is it something that you have to work on every day, every week, every month? Yeah, so I, I love what you said there. Consistency is huge in this. So the same way you wouldn't lift weights or do cardio or anything like that, do it for two weeks and then say, okay, I'm all done. I'm healthy now. Um, I've finished. Um, we think of working out your mind the same way you would think of working out your body. Consistency is so important. It's consistency of habit. It's consistency of developing routines. It's consistency of reshaping and making consistently small improvements to your thought patterns and changing your mindset and building the, the practical tools. And to do this, it's kind of like if anyone's ever been to like a, um, a weekend workshop, let's say you've gone to like a personal development workshop or something like that. And you've gone Saturday and Sunday and it's great. You know, you're, 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 you're learning new things and you're on top of the world and you've got this great group of people supporting you. Um, and you think my life's going to be different on Monday. Like it's, it's a new me, but then Monday comes and what happens? You just goes back to the same old, same old, because you're not in that environment anymore. That support system is gone. The community has gone. The person who was leading and guiding you and teaching you that they're not there anymore. There's no accountability, but imagine you could do that every week. Now you don't need two full days a week, but what if you could do it for one hour once a week for busy people? I got two young kids busy, busy life. Everybody's got a lot going on, but everybody can take one hour once a week to work out their minds and work on themselves and grow. And that's what we're all about. One hour once a week 
and it's going to have a huge impact on your life. This is very analogous with some of the things that we feel at the Leadership Project about leadership, uh, the idea mm. that you go to a leadership course for five days and all of a sudden you're a leader. It, it just doesn't work right. like that. It's, it's about, my, for us, it's about micro learning, it's about collaborative learning, and then it's about leadership in practice, going and trial and error, put, do it, get it into a habitual habit of practicing leadership, not just I went on a course and it was fun and I learned lots of things and I had a good time. That's what I'm hearing here about consistency of practice. Yeah. And th those courses are great. They're, they're oh, certainly they valuable. Yes. Right. Um, but to your point, it is a practice. It's not just something you do for a few days. It's, um, it's a lifestyle is what it is. This is who I am. This is what's important to me. This is how I show up. This is what I keep working on. Um, and by treating it like a lifestyle, it just kind of becomes a part of who you are. It doesn't even feel like a lot of our members will say it doesn't feel like hard work because it's just, you use the term micro changes and we're so big on those small, consistent, incremental changes that just every week, a little tweak here, a little adjustment here, and they, they add up and add up and add up, they snowball. Um, but that doesn't happen if you do it once and then never come back to it. Right. It's, uh, that consistency is huge. Yeah. I'm going to throw one metaphor. Uh, one more metaphor in there because it's popped into my head and I think this might nail it for the, for the audience. So I'm going to put it to be similar to brushing your teeth. So if you brush your teeth once and only once, you're going to soon be at the dentist with a lot of uh, teeth issues, a lot of pain in your mouth, et cetera, et cetera. If you brush your teeth every day, you get into that habit and you're keeping the dentist away, uh, so to speak. It's also probably true that if you skip brushing teeth once a day, your teeth are not going to fall out, but it's consistency over time that is going to keep your dental health in practice. And that's what I'm hearing for mental fitness. Is that a, how's that metaphor sitting with you? Yeah, I, I think that, that, that rings true. You can have a, a beautiful smile if you take good care of your teeth and you do it consistently. Um, and not everybody cares about having a beautiful smile. Right. Some people might say, you know what, I'm just going to brush my teeth once a day or I'm going to skip a couple of days. Um, I know there are times where my three year old would love to not brush his teeth. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's important that that consistency is important. You can think about it like brushing your teeth. You can think about it like exercising. You can think about it like diet. You can think about it like being a kind person. You don't do that once in a while. Hopefully, if you're a kind person, you show up consistently as a kind person and you use leadership. Great example. You don't show up as a leader when it's convenient or when you have time. You're a leader and you lead. I love that, Corey. You don't, it's not a convenient thing. It's a, it's a responsibility and you show up and you do it and it's a habit that you practice every day and you get better at it every day. It's also every a, day. a continuum where you, you practice your leadership every day and get better at it every day. You never stop learning as a leader. And what I'm hearing is you never stop learning when it comes to your mental fitness. Yeah, I, you never stop learning. You never stop growing. You never stop becoming a better version of yourself. Yeah. So long as you care about that and it's important to you, then, then that's the choice you make. That's a strong And decision. it's a great choice. It's the best choice. I mean, there we go. I, I'm biased for sure, but I, I, see, I see how it impacts lives. So. I want, to, I'm a big fan. I want to acknowledge your, your passion there, uh, Corey, and that comes across in, in how you've established your business. But I can see your face light up when you say, when you talk about that, that, that it is actually, a, this is a passion for you and it is your purpose. So let's talk about that. You talk a lot about purpose and fulfillment as being one of the pillars, if you like, of mental fitness. And you yourself, when you're talking about your history, you spoke about in those times where you felt like something that was missing, purpose was mm -hmm. one of the words that you used. Tell us more about what purpose and fulfillment means in mental fitness. Sure. I, I, everybody's looking for fulfillment in life, right? That like deeper sense of, of joy in your life, that thing that lifts you up and keeps you going. 
Um, people think of it as happiness. <clears throat> happiness is, there's a difference between happiness and fulfillment. Happiness is a temporary thing. It's, um, it's fleeting. It comes and goes. Whereas fulfillment is lasting. So if you think of happiness as, I don't know, I watch a funny movie or I eat a great meal or my team wins a game. Like it's great in the moment. I love it, but I kind of hit that happy and then it goes away. Um, whereas fulfillment is more of a, a lasting feeling that that thing that drives you, that keeps you moving. I think of the difference between happiness and fulfillment as um, I love my kids and I have a lot of happy moments with my kids, but they're also young and they can be a handful. And sometimes there's some not so happy moments in there, but no matter what's going on, I still love my kids with everything I've got, no matter what, like that never goes away. Uh, and that's the difference is happiness can kind of come and go, but that how much I love my kids, no matter what, that's fulfillment that just lasts and lasts and lasts. So that's the thing we're all looking for in our lives. We want our lives to be about something. We want to matter. We want to be a part of something that matters. I have yet to meet a person who doesn't care about mattering and being a part of something that matters. How that looks for everybody is different. The specifics are different, but we all want the same thing. We want to be fulfilled in our lives. We want our lives to be about something. We want to know that the world is a better place, even just by a teeny tiny fractional amount, but we want to know the world is a better place because we were here. Some people feel like they were born for a reason and they just haven't figured out what that reason is, but they're drawn to something. Other people aren't so sure about that, but they still feel like there's kind of best use of their life, if you will. Like there's a way that they could show up that makes their life better and also impacts other lives. I would say that there's a difference between uh, living a life of purpose and living a purposeful life or being purposeful. And the difference being, if you think of being purposeful, like just being intentional, making your decisions with intention, choosing with intention, showing up with intention, that's a huge part of mental fitness. Making your decisions, showing up the way that you want to and being present. It, this is a great little hack, if you will, for just practicing being present to catch yourself in each decision that you make and ask yourself, like, who do I want to be? How do I want to show up right now? It forces you to be present. For anybody who, who deals with any form of anxiety, well, anxiety is spending too much time in the future, spending too much time worrying about the past, right? You're not being present. So let's get present. This is a great way to do it. So that's being purposeful. Living a purposeful life or finding your life's purpose, connecting with your life's purpose. Again, this is something that, that so many of us are looking for. Um, and it was a big one for me. Uh, it was a big one for me, um, especially when I got to a point where I realized that there wasn't purpose in what I was doing for me, which isn't to say like, again, I was, I was, I, uh, I owned a, a restaurant. Life was good. Things were good. It was, it was a great business. And I knew a lot of people who were passionate about it, like other people who were in similar situations, they were passionate about the business. They loved it. Like this was purpose for them. It just wasn't for me. And there's no one size fits all. There's no right or wrong. Um, living your 10, there's no one living your 10. It's, it's your 10, right? It's, it's unique to you. <clears throat> but there are common pieces. Again, we all want to be happy and fulfilled. We all want to live purposeful lives. We want amazing, meaningful relationships. These are like three cornerstones. Um, and sorry, we want to realize our potential. That's that version of us that we want to be. We, we want to find out who we can be and realize that potential. Um, so purpose, I mean, purpose for me, finding purpose, it's a journey. It's a journey of honesty and self-reflection. And, you know, you look yourself in the mirror, you ask yourself questions that aren't always easy questions, um, but you got to ask them and you got to answer them honestly. But when you do, you start to piece them together. And I believe that purpose really goes hand in hand with, with our potential, with, with our growth. As we grow and as we discover who we're capable of being, we put ourselves in a situation, in a position to connect more with purpose because we know ourselves better. We know what we could do. We know how we could show up, or at least we have a better idea. Of. There are too many people I feel like they just kind of claim to have a life's purpose because they want one. So like, oh, this, this is my purpose. I'm here to you know, help animals or something, which is great if that's actually your purpose, but don't just choose it because it sounds good. Connect with it. Be intentional about your life. Be intentional about who you are. You'll figure out how you can best show up in the world for yourself and for everybody around you and the contribution you can make. And when you're honest with that process, it's not only is it going to change your life, it's going to change the life of everybody around you. So many powerful things there, Corey. I almost don't know where to start. There were 
<laughs> that, that, that last five minutes where you've been talking, there's so many life lessons in what you've just uh, shared. Well, I'll summarize some of them uh, back. Asking yourself questions, am I out there pursuing happiness and pleasure that is short-lived and has a decreasing half-life even? Because when you, when you get into that pleasure-seeking or happiness-seeking behavior, you need to go out and find more of it to achieve the same highs. It's very addictive. Or am I seeking joy and fulfillment? And I loved your analogy about children. Your love of your children never goes away. So try and extrapolate that into your life and go, well, what am I doing that gives me joy and fulfillment that is everlasting, that is renewable, that is sustainable, not the ups and downs of, of joy and, and happiness uh, from, sorry, uh, pleasure and happiness from something like eating a chocolate bar or going to a movie or going out for drinks with your friends, which is great while it lasts, but then as soon as it's over, it's, it's over. I love that. Yeah. And just to be clear, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't fill no. our lives with these happy moments, right? We absolutely should. Of course. Uh, we just don't want to rely entirely on that. In, exactly. With a lack of fulfillment. We're not at all telling you not to go out for drinks with your friends right. and have a good time. But, but what in your life is bringing you sustainable joy and sustainable um, fulfillment? I really like that message, Corey. The, the other one, living with intent. Did I live with intent today? Were my actions and my decisions with some kind of intent or was I just going about world and, and time was lapsing but really did I do anything with intent? I really love that message as well. You spoke about anxiety and I want to dig into that one a little bit and the two can go hand in hand here, purpose and anxiety and we are seeing some of this now. There's a lot of people out there, myself included, you, Zach Mercurio, a lot of us out there talking to people about finding your purpose. In some people, that's actually developing purpose anxiety where they on that search for their purpose and they almost panic and go, well, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Tell me what my purpose is. Yeah. Any advice for people out there that might be still on the search? Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I, I love Zach's work. He does great work. Um, glad you brought him up. I think of purpose as a journey, not a destination. So when I say that destination is, you know, I need to find my purpose today. Um, I would say as somebody who I feel like is in tune with my purpose, it continues to evolve. It's this journey that I'm on. And while I'm on the path, I don't exactly know where it ends up. I have big goals. I have big visions and dreams, but I don't know exactly where it ends up. And I believe the important thing to do is be on the path to be putting yourself in a position to be, again, living intentionally, living purposefully so that you can connect with purpose. I can very much appreciate the, the anxiety that comes with, hey, I, I want to find my purpose. I want to live my purpose. But I'm going to go back to a, a point that I mentioned earlier about your personal growth, which I believe the two are, are interlinked in a huge, huge way. Focus on your growth. Focus on growing and getting a little bit better every day. Be intentional about your growth. Be intentional about becoming who you believe you can be. It does not happen overnight, and it will not happen overnight, but it does happen. And as it happens, in my experience, it really aids, it really helps gain clarity around purpose. Think of it this way. You are, let's say right now, operating at like a six out of 10. And you're trying to figure out what your life's purpose is. I don't believe that your purpose belongs to a six out of 10 version of yourself. I believe it belongs to an eight, nine, 10 out of version of yourself. And when I say 10, I want to be clear, 10 is not perfect. There is no perfect um, Think of it like a 10 relationship. Show me a perfect relationship. It doesn't exist, right? It's not like a multiple choice math test. It's, it's just your best. That's the version of you that's going to connect with purpose. That's the version of you that's going to be able to live with purpose. Now, I know that there are some great ways, great tools, great exercises to help you discover a purpose. Simon Sinek is very big on starting with your why and understanding your why and discovering your why. Zach's got, I'm sure, some great tools and exercises to help find purpose as well. Um, I know that people like answers fast and we don't like being patient. Although I believe that so much of what's great about life happens with consistency, with intention and with patience. 
Um, and it's not like you have to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait for something to happen. As you grow, things happen. Your life continues to improve and improve. Whether or not you find a single answer for purpose tomorrow, <clears throat> I would say the best you can release some of that anxiety. It's not supposed to happen tomorrow. You don't need to find it right away. Just make sure you're on a path. And as long as you're on a path moving in a direction, you're going to be in great shape. Yeah, good advice, Corey. And I'll, I'll add just one thing and go, as you're on that path, look for things that are common threads that pop up, right? So when, when I think about my journey and I'm starting now my third career, if you like, I was in aerospace for 15 years, I was in the mobility industry for 15 years, and now my life's passion is to help leaders to create amazing teams and amazing workspaces, right? So, and, but the common theme in all of that was helping other people, right? So my, my joy and fulfillment comes in the service of others and helping them to become the best version of themselves. But it's that serving of others has been the common thread throughout my career. So when you do these exercises from Zach or from Simon, look for common threads and they're not necessarily, oh, leadership is my thing. It's not, but it's not what brings me joy and fulfillment. Joy and fulfillment comes from serving others, right? So look for underlying things uh, that are in there as well. All yeah. Right. I mean, purpose in a nutshell is like, how can I make my best contribution to the world around me? And I, saying your best contribution, not just a contribution, your best contribution is going to come from you being your best. So when you say to find those common threads, I absolutely agree with you. What is it that you can do or how can you show up in a way that is not necessarily unique to one individual in the whole world, but what is it about you that you can do better, that you can show up better, that is you at your best? Instead of trying to be like everybody else, how can you find those common threads of this is how I show up at my best? This is when I get lit up and passionate about things. This is what I actually care about in the world, which may be very different from what you've been told you're supposed to be caring about or you shouldn't be caring about. Just be honest with yourself. What's the mark you want to leave on this world? That's really good, Corey. And that brings me back to something you said about everyone wants to matter. So tell me, what's the connection between purpose and mattering? Well, I'll go back to something I mentioned earlier, just about, I, I remember when I had this, this kind of personal light bulb that goes off that I believe you're kind of either a plus or a minus or a neutral. You could be a plus or minus or a, or a neutral, which means you either have a positive or make a positive contribution to the people and world around you or a negative contribution. Um, or you could just kind of be in the middle, just kind of neither here nor there taking up space. And once you ask yourself, well, which one of those do I actually want to be? And I don't even believe so much in the neutral. I think, you know, if you're not positive, you're probably more on the, the negative side. So it's a simple realization that I'd rather be a positive than a negative. I want to make a contribution. Then you ask yourself, well, if I want to make a contribution, how much? Like, do I just want to be like just a teeny tiny bit on the positive side? Or do I want to be more on the positive side? I'm not asking you for an exact number right now, like out of 10. It's just recognizing that, that it's important to you. If you are making a positive contribution to the world, and when I say the world, I do not mean 7 billion people necessarily. It could be your friends, your family, your team at work, uh, any, anybody who is in your sphere of influence. If you are making a positive contribution, then you matter. I mean, you matter either way. Your life matters either way. It just might not matter for the way you want it to matter. But if you're making a positive contribution, you are creating a ripple effect. You're making other people's lives better. Your life matters. It's important. Your existence is important. The more, some of us care about that more, some of us care about that less. But I believe every one of us wants to matter and wants to know that, again, the world is a better place, even if it's just by a tiny little bit. But the world is a better place because I was here, because I cared, because I showed up. And that's important. Such a powerful question, Corey. And we practice a lot of self reflection at the Leadership Project. We we talk about what went well today, what didn't go well, what would I do differently if I had my time over again, what did I learn today, what did I learn about others today. So what did I learn about myself, what did I learn about others. I feel like we need to add a question, which is, did I make a positive contribution to the world or to others today? Or even mm -hmm. to start with your word intent, 
when I wake up in the morning, what am I going to do today that makes a positive contribution to the world? Hmm. That's a powerful question. I love that. It is. It is. And I do see how the potential for that day-to-day questioning of it to potentially add to purpose anxiety. Yeah, um, right. <clears throat> Right. It's like, oh, man, I, I didn't make the world a better place today. Like, you know, there's something wrong with me. And so, like, let's dial that back. Let's dial back the expectation of that. Yeah. How can you just positively show up sure. in the world? Because how you show up matters. Right. It's, it's infectious. People, think about it like laughter. If you laugh, if you're smiling, I'm a, I'm a big smiler. And I walk around, I smile and it makes other people smile. And I love that. So these things are infectious. Um, it's kind of just like walking the walk, if you will. Now, I'm a big believer that the greatest contribution you or anybody can make to the world is to become the greatest version of yourself. The greatest version of yourself will make the greatest contribution. And so if you're thinking about how do I make the world a better place? How do I make my contribution? How do I show up and impact people today? I would say focus on becoming that version of yourself that can have the greatest potential impact. Then what you do with that will kind of work itself out. You could be the greatest accountant in the world. You choose to be an accountant, be the greatest accountant, and you're passionate about accounting and you love accounting. Great. Take your accounting, apply it to something that you really care about. Go work for a company or a cause that really needs your excellent accounting. And by you giving the best of you to something you believe in, the world exponentially now becomes a better place. You don't have to be an accountant. You can do anything that you want with your life, but be honest with yourself about who you are and how you can show up and apply that to something that you care about and that means something to you. And you're going to live a life that matters, I can promise you that. I like what I'm hearing here. It's the intersection now of people having some awareness of what their superpowers are. What are, what are the skills that you bring to the table? And then making sure that you're applying those skills with intent to something that has meaning. Yeah, really, really good, Corey. And I want to agree with you uh, in terms of what you said about it, it, you don't have to change the world in one day. And I'm, I'm thinking Bill Gates now, he's very famous for saying people underestimate what they can do in a day, a week, a month, or even a year, but they underestimate what they can do in five years, 10 years, 15 years, right? So you don't have to change the world every day, but living with positive intent every day, little movements then add up to huge change over time. Yeah, that's, that's right. good advice as well. Yeah. One day, one decision at a time is how that happens. You don't get yeah. to 10 years by skipping ahead to 10 years. It's yeah. one day at a time. I know yeah. that sounds cliche, but it's so true. Yeah, good. All right. Now, now we're the leadership project, Corey. So we talk a lot to leaders that are leading other people. And so far, we've been talking a lot about finding individual purpose, individual meaning, and individually feeling like I matter. What are the leadership lessons out of this if you're leading a group of people? Um, A lot of my lessons in leadership. So like I mentioned, I I came up in the restaurant and bar business. I started serving tables in university and then bartending and then got into management. And over that time, I got to, to work with a whole bunch of different managers and leaders. And I got to study them. What made them effective? What made them least effective? And I said, when, when I get to be in a position of, of, the owner of the business, if you will. And, and I should stop myself there because you don't need a title to be a leader. Anybody can and has the opportunity to be a leader. But when I felt this responsibility of, okay, this is on me, like the buck stops here. How do I want to show up as a leader? Um, some of the things that, that I really took to heart were, I, I believe, some of the simplest things. First of all, what you do and how you show up matters. Like walking the walk really, really matters. And you do not need to be perfect. You do not need to feel like you have it all figured out. In fact, I am a huge, huge advocate of vulnerability and transparency and honesty, which I believe all go together. They all fit together. Um, People want to be respected. And by being honest with them and by being real with them, they feel respect and they feel like they matter. This is not specific to any industry. This is not specific to any job. This is just how you show up as a person. If you treat people with respect and with dignity and fairly, being fair is just so important. You know, don't treat your, you don't need to treat your high performers any differently than your lower performers. That We're all people, we're all on a team. And you can establish a culture of this is who we are and this is how we show up for each other. Um, people respond to that in a huge way. 
you don't need to pay them more. You just need to pay them fairly and give them a great environment to work in where they feel valued, where they feel appreciated, where they feel like they matter, coming back to mattering, um, where your values align. You know, you'll probably, I'm sure in your work, you hear lots of people talk about values and, and companies love to put values up on a wall and say, hey, here's our values. But anybody can do that. Are you actually living your values? And not just when it's easy. Not just when it's convenient, but all the time. Are you doing it when it's hard? Are you doing it when you're being tested? Can your people count on you to continue walking the walk consistently? It's just so important how you show up and how you lead. You, you have a greater responsibility than you can possibly imagine with the way people look to you as, as a leader. And I hope you take that 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 responsibility to heart because it, it does matter. There's no like brushing it off saying it doesn't. It absolutely does. But with that comes the opportunity to impact lives and change lives in an amazing, amazing way. And again, I, can, I believe you can do that by just sticking with a few core principles and really leaning into them. Again, honesty, transparency, vulnerability, um, optimism is a huge one. Not blind optimism, but learning how to, to be an optimist, I believe is, is huge. Um, and also within that, like a neutral objective thinker, there's a combination that, that has tremendous results. Um, you know, can you be gritty? Can you demonstrate grit and growth mindset? Again, you don't need to be a, a leader on paper to do this, but these are just some of these, these core, these fundamentals that, that change lives, your lives and the people that you lead. Uh, another wonderful uh, array of things that you've covered there, Corey, <laughs> and so many lessons. And I want people to listen to this episode multiple times because there's so many nuggets of gold that Corey is sharing in these, uh, these sections that he's going through. Treating people like they matter, right? So if you treat people like they matter, you know what? They will matter. They'll do work that matters. Knowing your values and living your values. Ariel O'Farrell, one of our good friends on the show, has written a book called uh, Values. They're not just for the office wall plaque. They're what you live and breathe every day. And you spoke about vulnerability. I'd love to div, uh, dig a little bit deeper into that. What does vulnerability mean to you, Corey? So I think of vulnerability a little bit differently probably than some. Um, before vulnerability was such an important thing to me, honesty was. I was just raised in a, in a home and with this understanding that honesty was everything. And you told the truth, even if it was hard, even if it wasn't fun, even if it wasn't comfortable. And I loved that because understanding the importance of trust um, and building trust in relationships um, was everything. Recognizing that if I could trust you and I didn't have to wonder if you were being honest with me, our relationship could, could flourish. But if I was doubting it, I'm always going to wonder. I'm always going to wonder. Um, and then there's always going to be a block between us. And so when it came to vulnerability to me, it was just an extension of honesty. This is what I'm dealing with. This is how I'm feeling. This is what I'm struggling with. Without the, I know that, that people feel like vulnerability might be a sign of weakness, right? Well, if I, if I project strength, then you're going to think I'm strong. But if I let you know the truth that I'm actually having a hard time with this right now, or I don't have it figured out, or I'm scared, um, then you might think less of me. And it's the complete opposite of that. Because again, by being real with people, by being honest with people, we build trust. That's just a fundamental principle. So being real and honest about the human experience, I mean, that's what vulnerability is to me. It's just, here's my experience as a human being. Here's what I'm going through. Here's what I've been through. Here's what I've learned. There's no stigma. There's no judgment. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is. It just is. And every single person goes through life like we're all just trying to figure it out, right? We're all trying to do the best we can with what we've got. We pretend that that's not the case. We pretend like, no, 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 I've got it figured out. But we're really only doing that because the guy beside us is acting like that way too. And we feel like, well, I got to measure up to him. I got to keep up with him. And if we could just let down the guard a little bit and just be honest and real with each other, which is what everybody's craving in this world. Um, we, not only are we going to build more trusting and, and deeper and more meaningful relationships, but we, can, we have the potential to change cultures, societies, the world by just breaking down that wall a little bit. Um, 
and I, I get that if you're, if you are, let's say raised, for example, in like a toxic masculine kind of upbringing where you are taught like, no, men don't cry and men don't share their feelings unless it's anger, then, then I respect that this is being vulnerable for you is, is going to be a reach. It's going to be a stretch. You can do it. You can absolutely do it, but start small, just start really small. And like with anything, like with any habit, with any new practice, just start really, really small. And for the rest of us who've had a little more experience with it, lean into it, lean into it. And, and I almost dare you to, to be vulnerable and not get a positive response from people who, who are just, who they say, thank you. Like, thank you for taking the lead. Thank you. Because I feel that way. I think that way. Do you ever talk about it? Well, no, of course not. Why not? Well, I don't know what other people are going to think. Let's get that out of the way. Again, I feel like vulnerable vulnerability is one of those things where you just lead by example. Um, the world needs it so very badly. And uh, I just be honest with each other. I want to acknowledge you there, Corey, something very powerful that you uh, recognize there that it's not going to be comfortable for everyone. If you have a, had an upbring, uh, upbringing where vulnerability was something that was not encouraged or even worse, was uh, disencouraged or, or, you know, told. Discouraged, yeah. yeah. Discouraged in terms of, you know, boys don't cry or men don't cry, et cetera. Uh, it is going to be challenging for some people, but start somewhere. And the, and the fact Start that, somewhere. Yeah. Just start, yeah. Um, two, two things popped into my head. Uh, the first one I think you've covered well, which is when you are vulnerable and when you show up as your authentic self, it gives other people the license that they can do it too. And that they will respect you, they will appreciate it, and then they can also bring their own authentic self, which is great for their mental health and their mental fitness if they're able to show up at work every day to be themselves instead of being some version of themselves that they think the world expects, right? Yeah. It's, it's exhausting. Not to mention how much work that is, by the way. Yeah. When you are always trying to project an image of yourself that you think the world expects, that takes a lot of work. It takes bandwidth. It takes energy. And if you're able to let that go and just be real and just be authentic, yeah. being who you really are doesn't take effort. It's because it's right. just who you really are. You breathe, you eat, you show up this way. Um, and when you have, when it takes less effort, you have more energy, more bandwidth to put into what you want to put it into. So while learning to be vulnerable might be uncomfortable and it might take some more, kind of like any new skill or new habit, um, once you kind of get the hang of it and you lean into it, you realize that it's just, it's a lot easier going through life being honest than it is trying to like tell a little white lie here and a little lie there kind of thing that, that, that takes a lot of work. I've learned this one the hard way, Corey. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. To be, to be thinking every day, what are people expecting of me right now? And trying to play the role that people are expecting you to play, that's exhausting. Turning up as yeah. yourself is a joy and it's just, oh, wow, I, I am enough and I can just be myself. That's a, a powerful thing, but it does take time. So be patient with yourself when you're doing this. But take the first step is what I'm hearing from Corey there, even if it's a small one. And, and let it be a small one. In fact, I, I'm a huge, huge fan of, of small, small steps. If you want to start exercising and you don't exercise right now, don't go join a gym and say, I'm going to go five times a week. Because you know what? You're not going to stick with it. You might be one of the outliers, one of the rare people who actually stick with it. But if you're like everybody else, you're not. Just get used to like putting on shorts. Start there. Do five push ups a day. Do five air squats a day. Like, start with the smallest possible thing that you can do and just get that right. We just, in the mental gym, we just uh, did a new habit and routine challenge where everybody picked a new habit that they wanted to, to start integrating. And one of the rules was like, how can you start with the smallest possible increment of that mm. um, and then build it and build it and build it because that's how it grows and that's how it sticks. Um, people aren't. Generally speaking, people don't like patience, right? So it's like, okay, I've decided I want to be in good physical shape. So I want to look like a bodybuilder. And if I can't have that in three weeks, then I'm just not interested. Well, this is why people don't get results. But if you can stick with it and take those smaller steps and they do build and they do snowball, but you got to kind of build that foundation first, that base, then you're setting yourself up for a lifetime of results, lasting results, evolving and growing results. And so be it vulnerability or anything, just, just start small. Just what's that, the, the smallest thing that you can do that moves you in a certain direction? 
And then the next decision you make, what's the next smallest thing you can do and just keep doing it that way. That snowballing effect is often underestimated. So let me share something with the audience and I'm, I'm picturing them all p- uh, getting their calculators out right now to ch- check my math. A 1% change done every day for a year adds up to, get this, 3,700% improvement on where you were. 3,700, 1% every day. Now you don't have to change 1% every day. I'm just trying to illustrate to you the snowballing effect. It really compounds. It compounds quicker than you think and uh, it creates sustainable change. Not like Corey said, if you, if you go from zero days at the gym uh, every week to five days, you're not going to sustain it. So working on those 1% is, is the key there. The other thing that popped into my mind when you were talking about vulnerability was a story from John C. Maxwell that I'd like to share. And I hope that this story helps people to take that first step towards vulnerability. He was at a uh, conference where he was giving a big speech about vulnerability and admitting your mistakes was the, the key on this one. And a leader challenged him and said, no, John, a leader should never admit their mistakes. That's a sign of weakness. And John's answer was just beautiful. That's because you think they don't already know. And just let that think in, sink in for a moment. When a, when a leader is able to share their weaknesses, share their failings very openly, people already know what those weaknesses are. They're very astute. They have BS radars. They, they, they're tuned in. And when you openly talk about it, everyone goes, ah, big sigh of relief. Ah, good. Yeah, the boss knows that he's not good at blah, 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 right? Right. Because they already knew, but they want to hear it from you. So that show that you're human, so they can be human. Any reflections on that? How can you, like, how can you trust and follow the lead of somebody who pretends to be perfect? Right, like you, like you said, they know you're not. They see it, but you're saying no, no, no. But you're wrong. I am perfect. Well, how am I supposed to trust you? How am I supposed to believe in you? How am I going to follow your lead? Right. So yeah, it's um, I you know I with with a lot of the the kind of rules and principles that I live by, vulnerability absolutely being one of them. I see them as necessities to, to live your 10. It just makes sense to be vulnerable. It doesn't make sense to forecast or to project an image of who you want to be that's not really you. It doesn't make sense to pretend that everything's fine when it's not. It doesn't make sense to pretend that you're perfect when nobody is. Like that doesn't make sense. It makes sense to be real. It makes sense to be honest. It makes sense to be vulnerable. And I agree with, with Maxwell. I mean, any leader who, who thinks that the, a leader needs to like never admit, never say you're sorry, oh, I, I could not disagree with you more. If you mess up, the first thing you do is apologize and take responsibility for it. Mm. All right. We've, we've covered a lot of ground so far, but, but in terms of your work, we're only scratching the surface. I've, I've been studying your work a lot, Corey, since we agreed to do the the interview and there's so many more facets to it. I want to move us on now to optimism and you did bring it up before and you do speak about the power of optimism. What can you share with the audience about the power of optimism in a leader? So if we're going to, to grow as individuals, if we're going to grow as organizations and companies, if we're going to make the world a better place, we need to believe that it's possible. If we don't believe it's possible, why would we do it? If you were going to try to lose weight, but you didn't believe that losing weight was even possible, then why would you exercise, diet, change anything, right? So you have to believe that something is possible. You can believe that it's not possible, or you can believe that it is possible. It takes no more effort to believe that something is possible. It's just a choice, right? It can go this way or it can go this way. And the truth is there's both. It might work out. It might not work out, but it might work out. And now you got to choose which one of those things. Again, I'm looking at this almost like it started with me as like a logical argument. It was logical to be optimistic. Because if I believe something's possible, I'm going to work in that direction. If I don't believe it's possible, I'm not going to work in that direction. How am I going to improve? How am I going to become who I want to be? How am I going to make change happen if I don't believe that I can do it? So I simply need to say, hey, you know what? That could happen. 
once you try that on for size and start doing it more, it, and again, it really is just a choice between possible versus impossible. And I do not care much for the word impossible. Um, once you just kind of make that decision and then you try it on, you realize that your results get better. By choosing what's possible and working towards what's possible, your results get better. You accomplish more, you achieve more, you grow more and grow faster. Well, now it just makes sense. I'm going to keep being optimistic. I'm going to keep looking at what I believe is possible. And you can even stretch your level of optimism to the point where I kind of consider myself an unwavering optimist now. That, And I, and I want to say that this does not mean that you do not consider that things might not work out, that you're not blind to the possibility that things don't always go according to plan. I can promise you things don't always go according to plan, but hey, that's just part of the journey. And when they don't go according to plan and when life knocks you on your ass, do you believe that it's going to get better or do you believe it's not going to get better? The optimist says it is going to get better and I'm going to be fine. The pessimist says it's not. Um, I know a lot of people like to say, well, I'm just a realist. I'm not, a, I'm not an optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm just a realist. I'm just being real. To them, I say, compared to what? Like you're, real based, you're being real based on what? Based on your interpretation of what's possible and what's not possible. So if you tell yourself it's not possible and you say realistically, again, another word I don't love, uh, realistically, that's not possible. Well, then you're, you're a pessimist. You can be an optimist and a realist. If your reality is optimism, you can be an optimist and a realist together. Um, and I'll add to that uh, being neutral and objective in your thinking. So you can objectively be an optimist. Because again, you can look at two situations, it could work out, it could not work out. And you can objectively look at it and say, okay, where do I want to put my energy? What's going to get me a better result? Again, you're not ignoring the other side of it. You're not being naive. You're not being delusional. You're just choosing what makes the most sense. By choosing it, not only do your results get better, but I got to tell you, it's a lot more fun living as an optimist. It is a lot. Uh, it's going to make your life happier. It's going to bring you a lot more fulfillment. Um, I know people are wired differently, but I, I got to say, choose optimism. It is, it is such a great choice to make. There's three powerful things I'm hearing there, Corey. Uh, first one makes me think of uh, Henry Ford, and he's very famous saying, uh, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. right? Yeah, so love the, that quote. That's the, that's the power of self-belief, if you like. The second thing, I love that confronting truth about the difference between optimism, pessimism, and people that call themselves realist. And I love that you're bringing to the table that you can be objective and an optimist. All right. And not being delusional, but being optim optimistic and being objective about what is the art of the, the possible and positive that you can achieve in whatever is your undertaking. And the third one, I think, was really powerful in your message. Everything you said was adding optimism with action. It wasn't optimism, I'm an optimist and things are going to magically be great because I th thought it. Everything you said in your message was about taking that optimism and putting it into action. What's your reflection on that? Um, I, it's so important. So this first kind of dawned on me I, when I was growing up, I, I was, I liked sports. I liked hockey. Um, I would watch basketball and I would see these athletes who, when they were just being honest would say, you know, I'm the best in the world, or I want to be the best in the world. Or when they were younger, they envisioned being the best in the world. That was their goal. I want to be the best player in the world. That is very optimistic to think you are going to be like the best hockey player in the world, basketball player, anything in the world. There is no way you're going to become that person without putting in the work, putting in the effort and making it happen. So here's who I want to be. Here's what matters to me. But the best players in the world, they're also the hardest workers. And they're the ones who work on the fundamentals. Those are the ones who put in the hours, just doing the most like boring, tedious things because that foundation needs to be rock solid. You create your reality, right? You, you can be optimistic about everything, but if you just sit on your couch and watch Netflix 24 seven, 
I got nothing wrong with watching a little bit of Netflix here and there, but if that's your life and you're not creating anything, you're not making it happen, then nothing happens. Um, yet if you choose to be optimistic and you recognize that this is possible, but it's only possible if I make it possible, well, then you'll make it happen and you'll see how very possible it is. Fantastic, Corey. Thank you. Uh, and I think that rounds that topic out nicely. I want to cover one more before we get to the rapid round. This one was really powerful when I was reading your work as well. Tell me about the role of relationship communi- and communication in someone's mental fitness. So for anybody who's ever been in a uh, uh, I don't want to say negative relationship, but let's say one that, that takes some work, takes a lot of work. It's a hard relationship. And it's, it's got a lot of, every relationship's going to have its ups and downs, but think of one that's, that's kind of draining you. You don't leave it at home, right? You go to work, you take it with you. You go see your friends, you take that relationship with you. On the flip side, if you've got a, a, like a really great relationship, you also take that with you. You take it with you everywhere you go. So it impacts your life in such a huge way. Also such a huge part of fulfillment is relationships. There's really three components to fulfillment. One is your personal growth. One is the contribution you make or the kind of living an intentional, purposeful life. And the other is the quality of relationships that you have, the most meaningful relationships, not quantity, but quality of relationships. I grew up in a home where my parents loved each other, but I learned very early that marriage was hard and it took work and it doesn't always work out. So my parents were kind of together, apart, together, apart, together, apart. And I had to you know, you see some realities of life early. And I looked around at a lot of my friends' parents as I was growing up, and a lot of them were divorced too. Now, my parents, I, I can't speak for anybody else's parents, but my parents were good, smart people. They loved each other, and it just it wasn't working, but I could pick out a lot of reasons why. I could see it kind of not being the one in that marriage. You can kind of see why things aren't working out. One of the biggest things was communication a lack of communication where one person is kind of saying, kind of telling one story, the other person is telling another story. It's just not matching up perfectly. And if it doesn't match up perfectly, there's always room for miscommunication, misunderstanding, which leads to drama. And I am not a fan of drama. I have no room for drama um, in my life. I just, it it, it does not help. Um, And drama happens when there's miscommunication. And my wife and I, we've been together over 10 years. We've had one fight and it wasn't like a blow up fight, but just kind of one fight. And that was over a miscommunication. And we put a rule in place. Like we saw where that miscommunication happened when that's never happening again. Um, we still disagree on things, but always just very respectfully. And we're so open in our communication and honest in our communication. Uh, the conversations that people would consider like uncomfortable conversations that they don't want to have lean into them, have them. They're important. They are so important. They're important for building trust. They're important for building that feeling of team, like we're in it together. They're certainly important for conflict resolution and making sure you're on the same page. So you don't have that friction and have that drama. You know, again, growing up in this, this kind of household, seeing it this way, I saw that you could be a really good guy and still like marriage doesn't necessarily work out for you. Um, When I met my wife, I put this, this rule in place with her. So actually, I'm going to go back to my previous relationship before my wife, uh, my girlfriend then. There were things that were important to her that I didn't recognize were important to her because, hey, I couldn't read her mind. And I tried to be a good boyfriend and, and good at this whole boyfriend thing, but there was just some things that didn't click for me. And so because of that, she felt like I wasn't being the kind of boyfriend I could be and wasn't doing the kind of thing I could be doing when really I just didn't know. And so when my wife and I started dating, one of the very first kind of relationship rules I put in place or asked her uh, to, to respect was, if there is anything that is important to you, if there's anything that you want me to know, if there's anything you feel like I should know, even if you think I should get it, even if you think I should understand, just in case there's a little wiggle room or a little opportunity that I might not get it, please explain it to me like I'm five years old. Because I would so much rather I understand this than not understand it because I'm like a proud guy and you don't need to tell me. And I just want to understand it because I cannot, I, I don't want my relationship, my, my most important relationship being with my wife. I don't want that to break down or to be anything less than it could be. 
because we weren't open and honest in our communication. So I am, I'm such a big, this goes back to honesty, back to vulnerability, all of it. It all ties together. Um, communicate effectively, communicate honestly and openly, and your relationship is going to be so much better. Got three takeaways there from what you're saying, Corey, and then I've got a couple of questions. So firstly, that none of us are mind readers. Right, none of us. None of us are mind readers. The second one would be, and this is a big weakness for me, Here's, this is my vulnerable moment for today's episode. I do avoid confronting conversations and, and that's something I need to work on. It is something I am working on, but it's something that uh, has plagued my life, uh, my entire life has always been to be avoiding that, that uncomfortable conversation and it's something I'm working on. And then the third one is then the openness and the transparency, right? So um, remembering that the other person is not a mind reader. So if there's something that you really want them to know about you, about your needs, about your values, about your desires, don't expect that they're going to guess it. Just, just tell them. And I love what you said about treat me like I'm a five-year-old and explain it in simple terms and then there's no misunderstanding about what you're trying to, to get to. So really good. Want to, yeah. want to flip that a bit. That applies to all relationships, yeah. right? Yeah, at exactly. home, at work, like yeah. everything. It's, it's the same thing. Very good. Very good. Um, so I'm going to flip that now and then I want to ask two questions then about the same topic. What about the danger of assumptions? Assumptions are dangerous. There's, <laughs> there, there's a, a danger in assumptions. So um, I, uh, we can, so think about this like going out for dinner. You're going out for dinner with a friend and you make plans. We're going to meet at six o'clock at Joe's restaurant you make that agreement, right? Like you have that understanding it's in black and white, six o'clock, this restaurant, we're going to meet there. Would you ever make plans with a friend and just say, okay, we're going to meet for dinner, but you don't discuss the time and you don't discuss where you're going to go. I actually had this happen once with a friend of mine. There were two locations of the same restaurant and I was waiting for him at dinner and I'm like waiting and waiting and like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm like, it's so weird that he would be late and not, not let me know. And I called him and he, he's, he says to me, where are you? I'm like, I'm at the restaurant. I'm waiting for you. He's like, I'm at the restaurant. Where are you? Well, we were at two different locations because we made an assumption that we knew which restaurant we were going to. We ended up in two different spots. So the, diff- the way to avoid assumptions, and this is huge in relationships, uh, is to have agreements instead. So instead of assuming something, make an agreement. Yes, this is the thing that I agree to. This is, these are the terms. These are the details. This is the information. The agreement is, We're going to meet at six o'clock at Joe's restaurant and this very specific location of Joe's restaurant. The agreement in my home is I will take out the garbage. That's like one of my jobs. I got to take out the garbage. If we just made an assumption about it, the garbage would sit there all day. Right. Um, Who's making dinner tonight? My wife says, I'm making dinner tonight. Great. Agreement. You're making dinner tonight. If we didn't address that and we're just assuming each other's going to make dinner, then dinner doesn't get made. Uh, side note there, my wife doesn't like me cooking very much because she's definitely the, the superior cook in the family and she doesn't like my food. Um, but, but in all of these things, right, we, it, it does not take a lot of effort to clarify things, to agree on things and just say, yep, that's what I meant. That's what we expect of each other. Like think about it uh, at work. Um, you have a task or a job that somebody needs to do, but they're not clear on what their job is or what their role is or what you expect from them. And then they show up and they, they say like, hey, hey, here's this, this project that you asked for. And you're like, well, that's not what I wanted. And they said, well, I thought that's what you want. And you're like, no, this is what I want. Well, how are they supposed to know that? Like you said, they're not mind readers. So no assumptions. Assumptions lead to miscommunication. Assumptions lead to drama, which again, we don't want. And not only that, once you have that, then you got to like rebuild it. You got to fix that thing. You, you lit a fire. Now you got to figure out how to put it out. Just turn those into agreements ahead of time. Avoid the confusion. Avoid the drama. Just keep moving forward without the friction. This, this requires a little bit of self-awareness. Uh, and firstly, or actually, I need to thank you because it is my morning that I need to take the garbage out. So you've just reminded me. So thank you for <laughs> that. The, yeah, uh, what, I'm, what I'm hearing there is clarity. It's about clarity. And it's also a little bit about self-awareness as well, that if you catch yourself, making assumptions about what is expected of you or making assumptions about someone else's intent or 
whatever the case may be, just test them. Just test those assumptions and talk about it and talk about it with clarity and openness. And that can avoid a whole heap of snowballing effect. This is now negative snowballing effect that where assumptions mm-hmm. can really make a relationship unravel. So that's great, uh, Corey. Yeah. The I next like that point about testing it. Yeah, test it. Right? Just like, hey, here's what I'm thinking. Is this what you're thinking? Yeah, exactly. Um, Either yes, it is, or no, it's not. Let's clarify. And that right? takes so. 30 seconds. It takes 30 seconds yeah, and it, could so say, fast. It could uh, avoid so much heartache in the future of finding out later that there was a misunderstanding. The other one I want to yeah. test on, and we're not here to dissect your parents' relationship, but you said something really interesting about the story that each of them was telling. And those stories would have been true for both of them. Tell me about yes. the role of perspective and perceptions in relationships? Good question. So every single one of us has our own unique perspective on the world and on life, on how things work, all of it, because we've spent, I've spent my entire 43 years seeing the world through Corey Chadwick's eyes. I cannot see it through anybody else's eyes, no matter how hard I try. Everything that I've done, learned, experienced, every time I've fallen on my face, everything that I've ever felt, every time that I've accomplished something or doubted myself, every relationship that I ever have, that's unique to me. So my perspective of the world is going to be unique to me as well, which means you and I are going to look at the exact same thing and see it differently. You're going to say it's blue and I'm going to say it's red. And you're going to say, how can you say that it's blue? And I'm going to say, how can you say that it's red? So again, there's where an assumption comes in. Wait, what color are you seeing here and why? Um, Recognizing that we have our own unique perspectives and that every single one of us does is such an important part. You said self-awareness. Well, Everything that we've talked about today has that common thread of self-awareness. It all comes from a place of self-awareness. When you recognize that you have your own unique perspective, it means you also recognize that everybody else does too, which means my way of seeing things or my opinions about something are just, they're mine. They're valid. They're important, but they are mine. They're not universally correct. Your opinion is valid. What you feel matters how you see things matters and again let's just be open and honest about that hey here's what i'm thinking feeling whatever if we could do that imagine the the amount of world conflict that we have now with people with different belief systems and different ideologies we could break so much so much of that down if we could just appreciate and understand that my way might be right for me but it's not the right way it's a way that makes sense to me and it probably only makes sense to me because this is all that i know I've never really seen different perspectives. I've never really been a, put myself in a position to make like an educated choice. So I'm just going with what I know. Think about how so much of uh, so many of us are just brought up a certain way. Our parents have political beliefs or religious beliefs or whatever it is. It's, it's like, that's what we know. It's just normal to us. So recognizing that we each have our own normal. Um, and then, you know, you asked uh, about my parents' relationship. They, if you ask them what went wrong or what was going wrong at the time, they're giving you different answers, right? It's, well, this is what she's doing. Well, this is what he's doing. You're not even talking about the same things. You're talking about different things here. And it's entirely possible that if you just communicated that with each other properly and not, not in a blame sort of way, not in a finger pointing, not in a, hey, you're wrong, but more like, we're just, we're in this together. This is important. This is how I feel like when you do this thing. I'll give you an example. I remember the first time um, a girlfriend that I lived with explained to me why it was important that I put the toilet seat down. It's just such a, it's just a thing that we just like, we take for granted completely. Men say, I'm leaving the toilet seat up. And what's the point? What's the problem? And women say, why can't you put the toilet seat down? And I would say, well, if, if, I, if I leave it up, just put it down. And she'd say, why can't you just put it down? And we could go back and forth on that forever. But when she explained to me that she's like, I know it's not your intention, but I, it's actually like kind of comes across as disrespectful when you don't put it down. As soon as she said that, I never left the toilet seat up again because I didn't understand at all. Again, not a mind reader, but I didn't understand that to her it was actually a respect issue. Right. And so my perspective, her perspective, different. Communicate. No assumptions there. Problem resolved. Easy, easy. So what's happening there is you're removing it from 
the actual situation and, and getting it to the emotion that's being felt there. And the emotion was the, was the disrespect, not the not the actual action itself. Yeah, really, right. really powerful, Corey. The the takeaway I'm taking from that, and this takes work too. The, this one is challenging, but everyone in the audience start thinking about this: that every single person on this planet is looking at the planet through their lens. The first level of self-awareness is to realize that your lens is just your lens and that there's more than one. And then the second level of realization is to start thinking, oh, okay, yeah, someone else is looking at this through a different lens. And this is a topic for another day, but when you start getting into what we call second and third loop learning or or second or third loop uh, thinking is to be able to remove yourself from the situation and stop looking through your eyes and start looking at it in a holistic way, a helicopter view or a fly on the wall view where you're not looking even necessarily like empathy would be trying to look through someone else's eyes. Second and third loop thinking is actually looking at it from the outside in and going, and you have these moments of Oh, like, so you can imagine Corey in his relationship with his parents, he's hearing what his mother is saying. He's hearing what his father is saying. And Corey's got a third look. Well, imagine if there was a helicopter look that was, that was looking completely um, objectively at the situation and, and understanding that there's multiple perspectives at every single situation you have in life. And if you come to this realization, I think it can be very good for your relationships and it could be good for for your mental health. Absolutely for those two. And also just for for kind of making good progress in life, right? Objectivity is a a great advantage to us. Um, When you are objective, you can see choices objectively and gives you the opportunity to make the best choice. Uh, Recognizing none of us are capable of fully being objective because we have our own biases and, and perceptions and lenses that we see it through recognizing that and then just trying to be objective, making the effort to be objective is, is huge. Yeah, very good. And everyone's perception is their own truth, right? And you've got to, and that's why they'll get into these situations where how on earth could you think that? Because their truth is true for them, right? So yeah, really, really powerful, Corey. You know what? We're, we've been talking for, I think it must be about 80 minutes and I got into a complete flow state and was completely absorbed in everything that you've been saying. And I feel like we could go for another seven hours and I still wouldn't have run out of uh, questions and cur- curiosity. Like uh, curiosity is in abundance here right right now. And I, I, f- I feel like that we could go on forever, but I'm sure the audience would like to see us wrap it up now. I want to start with uh, my, my closing questions almost in reverse order now. What does the mental gym look like? If someone wants to come and do work with you, Corey, what does that even look like? So all of our classes are live over Zoom. Group classes, we also do individual one-on-one private training. So think about it coming to, if you've ever been in a Zoom meeting, it's kind of the same structure, a group Zoom meeting. And what we do is our classes, they have this great energy to them, this great vibe of like, we're in here together. We're growing together. We're here to live our 10. So it's like-minded people who show up to work out their minds and work on themselves and grow together and to support each other and push each other. Each class has a topic or a curriculum, if you will, that, that we follow through the class. So my job as a trainer would be to teach this curriculum, but it's very much discussion-based. It's not like a lecture. It's, hey, what do you think about this? Let's question this. Let's work on this idea. We start off every class with something we call wins, which is celebrating and acknowledging our growth throughout the week. And a lot of the time, it's those little teeny tiny wins, those those incremental gains, because we know how important they are. Sometimes it's big wins. Sometimes there's some really cool big things happening, and we make sure we, we acknowledge all of it. Then we get into our workout for the day. We wrap up our workout with something we call self-work, which is like a little bit of homework that, that you take home with you, take what we work on in class and start implementing it into your life to something we talked about before. Practicing it is so important, not just thinking about it, but actually doing it and implementing it. Um, And we wrap up every class with something we call takeaways and gratitude, which is just what's your big takeaway from today? What's that one big thing that's sticking with you? And something that you're grateful for, all things that are so great for our mental fitness. Um, And really that, that, that workout itself is about pushing you and challenging you to think and think differently, stretching you, how you, stretching how you think, having you explore different perspectives. It's not about telling you who to be or what to do or how to think. 
It's about giving you options and you choose what makes most sense for you. We make a lot of sense. So you choose what makes the most sense for you and then you implement it and you make an adjustment here and you make a tweak there. And by doing that week in and week out, you build that consistency. It's like building a muscle. You're building that, that mental muscle, that brain muscle. It's like switches flip in you. And once they flip, they don't flip back. They flip and you just get to build on that. And you flip and you get to build on that. Each class connects with the, uh, with the next class. So last week's class is going to connect with this week's class. This week's class is going to connect with last week's or with next week's class. So there's a real flow to what we do. Um, it's, there's no start and end date. New members can join whenever they want to join. They join the gym. They come in where we are. Really short learning curve. And then they're good to go. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a great way to work on yourself. It's a great way to grow. Um, quite frankly, it's a big reason for me starting the mental gym is because it's something that I wish I had on my own mental fitness journey on my journey to be my best self and live my best life and live my tent just didn't exist. And I thought we, we need this. That's a great innovation there. Finding a gap that you would have liked in the world and then filling it really good, Corey. Sounds very powerful, and I'd like to encourage the audience uh, to look into this. This sounds like something that all of us could benefit from. How do people get in contact with you if they do want to participate? Yeah, so if you're thinking about the mental gym for yourself as an individual or for your team or organization, uh, you can contact us. Go to our website, mentalgymlife.com. That's mentalgymlife.com. Best way to learn a little bit more about us, contact us right through the website. I'm also on LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn and you want to connect with me, uh, say hi, ask me any questions, anything you want. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. So uh, that's the best way to find me um, on social. Uh, those are the two best ways. Website, LinkedIn, you're good to go. Thanks, Corey. Now that's normally the last question that we ask. And so now I'm going to go back to my other rapid fire questions. So because the audience probably get used to these questions. So let's uh, go through those as well. What's the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? Trust your gut that whatever you feel is kind of speaking to you in life, whatever you believe is true about yourself and important to you, just trust it and go with it because it's right and it's always right. Um, And there's a lot of people who will tell you why it's not right or why you should be more like them or do it more kind of the conventional way. Um, But your gut knows and learn how to trust your gut. Yeah. Okay. Powerful stuff as well. What's your favorite book? Um, oh, so many. Okay, I'll, go, I'll give you two. I'll give you a fiction book and a, and a nonfiction book. Um, fiction book is one I read relatively recently called The Three-Body Problem. It's um, a science fiction book. Um, it's just really imaginative thinking, uh, really smart writer. I actually picked it up because it had a Barack Obama endorsement on it. It's... <laughs> I was like, if Brock likes it, I'll check this out. And it was really, really good. It's actually a trilogy. The trilogy was really strong too. Um, nonfiction, I've got so many that I really enjoy. I'm going to go with a classic and just say the seven habits of highly effective people. For anybody who's looking for, I mean, at any stage of your, your growth journey, it's such a great read. It breaks really big, important concepts down into such manageable parts and understandable parts. Um, oh, also Atomic Habits. I loved Atomic Habits. I know you asked for one. I gave you two. I'll stop there. I'll, I'll go with those with those books for now. All right. We want to get James Clear on the show, actually. So we, we want to oh, get right great. into Atomic Habits for sure. Okay, very good. Uh, favorite quote? Um, favorite quote? Um, why am I forgetting my favorite quote? I have it in my head. Oh, there is. it's Nelson Mandela. And he says, there is no passion to be found playing small in settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. And I believe that's true for every single one of us. And if you're looking for passion in your life and you haven't found it, pay attention to that quote. And that sounds like the difference between a six or a seven and living your 10. So that's a, Absolutely. a, a wonderful way to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Corey. I've thoroughly enjoyed today. I learned so much and I know our audience has as well. So thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Mick. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And keep on living your 10. You got it. Today's episode was brought to you by my new book, You're a Leader, Now What? 
The Proven Path to High Performance Leadership. The book contains many of the great lessons that we have learned together here on the Leadership Project podcast, together with lessons that I've collected over my 30-year career as a leader. The book is aimed towards first-time leaders, but really there's something in there for everyone. If you would like to show your appreciation for this show, we would greatly appreciate if you were able to go and get your copy of the book on Amazon as either an ebook or a paperback, and if you could leave us an honest review on Amazon. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Project podcast at mixbeers.com. A big call out to Faris Sadek for his sound design and editing of our audio and video content, and to the whole team at TLP. Joanne Goes On, Gerald Calabo, Rika Vadanes, and my wonderful supportive wife, Say Spears, who is also our operations manager. This show would simply not be possible without you. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and review at Apple Podcasts. You can catch the video podcast and our video of the week at the Leadership Project YouTube channel. And you can join the conversation at the Leadership Project Facebook community group. We look forward to bringing you more great content and interviews next week as we continue to learn together and lead together. In the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.